All right, I gotta find my place here. So I thought I was, we was gonna be done with the questions, but somebody pointed out that there was a whole another list of questions on another um, another place where it was posted on Facebook, and so I want to be faithful to that, and so I uh, wrote down five more questions that were on this list, and. I was hoping that Susie would be here to write these down. She kept me straight in the last set. I had forgotten one, and she kept me straight on it. But uh, the new questions were, why should I fear God, or what does it mean to fear God? It was one of them, which we'll talk about tonight. And number two, the second one, do I have to join a church to be a Christian? Very good question. Very good question. Number three, why does Paul forbid women to teach? Good question. Something that needs to be addressed for sure. Number four, I was baptized as a baby. Isn't that good enough? And a very good question. And then number five, which will be the, the toughest one to answer in very grave detail, are creation days 24 hours or long periods of time? Are creation days 24 hours or long periods of time? Big controversy right now in the church about that be easy just to say well the Bible says in the evening and the morning was the first day so we know it's 24 hours and that's what I believe but there's a whole lot of people that are that have science involved in that and they it's hard for them to see that with what they've been taught in their colleges and so it's going to take an extensive breakdown of why um, we would think or believe that creation days are 24-hour periods and not um, like the evolutionists believe, Christian evolutionists. Doesn't even sound right, but there are those out there that would believe that God created the universe and everything in it in millions and billions of years. And so we'll tackle that one in the near future. But number one, why should I fear God or what does it mean to fear God? First glance, I thought I'll tackle that one later. And But uh, something took place this week that made me want to answer it first. And so we're going to tackle this. I put a bunch of scriptures together, and I i mean a bunch. They're not all on this screen, but because I, I couldn't, didn't have time to get them all on there. But uh, we have conflicting ideas. Even in the Bible, they're not conflicting ideas, but they seem to be because there's different aspects to the word fear. Fear sometimes is a good thing, and fear can be a bad thing. Anybody tell me when fear is a good thing? Rose? Yeah, that's a good one. Fear is a good thing when it keeps you from touching fire. Fear is a good thing when it keeps you from running out in front of a car. Fear is a bad thing when it keeps you from doing something that you know you should do, but it's hard, and so you fear the what it's going to take. You fear rejection, maybe. And that's when it becomes bad. And that's why it seems like you got conflicting ideas in the Bible. 
just go through some here real quick. This is in First Peter 2.17. says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. I put that up or just for that fear God one. All those others are relevant because that's how you fear God is honor all men, honor the king, love the brotherhood. That is the definition of fearing God. And I know that's like preaching the end of the sermon right there, but this verse teaches us to fear God. And then this verse says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we're told to fear God, and then we're told not to fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear. And that would be the difference of it. Fear has more than one. Um, it's really just one meaning, but in a different contexts is where it gets um, its definitive meaning, put it that way. Mankind is told to fear God, and then we're told that God has not given us the spirit of fear. So fear, depending on the context, is the deciding factor in whether or not we do something. <clears throat> fear is good when it, as we said, stops us from doing something dumb. And fear is bad when it makes us do things prematurely or when it keeps us from doing something that we know is right but going to be hard. And uh, we've got another verse of Scripture. This is Psalm 139.14, and this is David speaking to God. And he says to God, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, if we had one definition of fear, he would be saying that God created him in fear, like he was scared to create him, you see. God wasn't afraid to create David fearfully. It, it means he paid attention to detail. Does that make sense? It's like he was careful to do everything just right. So this is already teaching us what fear of the Lord is, isn't it? It's to pay attention to detail. It's to not be flippant with your religion. I hate to even use that word. With your relationship. Don't use that word religion. Relationship. It is a religion, but the only time religion is spoken of good in the Bible is it's it's said it's called pure religion. And so David says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. That's speaking from a place of wisdom, for sure. God paid attention to detail. And then, going back to 1 Peter, we're told to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So he's not telling us to tremble at the thought of talking to somebody. He's telling us to pay attention to detail. Like when I started this series of answering these questions, I said, we're not going to just fly over these and just say what we believe. We're going to delve into the Scripture and show Scripture upon Scripture the answers to these questions. So people will not say to us, you didn't care about answering that question really. You didn't care about me in answering that question you you just mold over it and uh, didn't you didn't pay attention to detail you didn't have a careful attitude when you were pouring over 
the scriptures to try to answer this question. And that's what it means when we're supposed to save people with fear. It doesn't mean we scare them into getting saved. It doesn't work. God says, and Paul said, it is by the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. And when they see that goodness in you, that's what leads them to you. That's what draws them to you is goodness, not your wrath. And so meekness means our meekness as in we come to them in meekness. We don't come to them in um, forcefulness and try to make them receive God. We come to them in meekness, telling them in detail why it's good to serve God and telling them why what has happened to us in our lives serving God and all the good that has come from it, not all the not money raining out of the sky and stuff like that, but just the, the sustaining strength that we get from the Lord. That's coming with meekness and fear. When we take the time to, to answer the questions that they have for us. Remember some of the questions were exactly what this thing is talking about. Why are you a Christian? That's that right there. Why are you a Christian? Well, if we'd given answers that wasn't in fear, in carefulness, in paying attention to detail, it's not going to do any good. <clears throat> and so... With that background, let's go all the way back to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4 is where we see the first time that um, the fear of the Lord is not really followed. And then we see it uh, in the law also. And I believe this will help us to see what the fear of the Lord means. I think we've already kind of got it. But I think this will put it into our minds even deeper, I hope. We all know the story of Cain and Abel. And uh, here in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, it says, And Adam knew, his, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well... Sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. There is no way in the world I could have ever understood what this meant without the New Testament and without a conversion that took place within me. When I first got right with God and, and started trying to live for him, I was very zealous and I, had, I was like Peter when he was walking with Christ and he wanted the rules to be kept, you know, and he wanted everybody to keep the rules at least as good as him or, or they weren't allowed with them, you know. The, the, that spirit that was in him, that's in a lot of people. But once you are converted and you, you realize it's all about humility and uh, not pushing things on others, then this becomes very clear in what take, took place here. And uh, it says, When Abel brought 
that Abel brought the firstlings of his flock. What Abel was doing there was bringing the very best of what he had. The very best. Firstlings doesn't mean the firstborn of the sheep. Because you might have a firstborn of a a young you sheep that usually their firstborn is kind of sickly because it's their first baby. I know when my dad had cows, a lot of times the first, the heifers, the first calf that they would have would be small. It would be really sickly and a lot of them wouldn't make it. When it says the firstlings, it's saying the choicest. The choicest of it. And then um, when it says, and the fat thereof, we know that that's talking about the, the fatted sheep, the ones that are growing good, the, the ones that are really worth a lot. This is what Abel brought. And it just says that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Doesn't say anything about the choicest of the vine. See, we see that in other places in Scripture that husbandmen would bring of their choicest vine to offer to the Lord. You don't see that here with Cain. He just brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And what would take place, see, even way back then, these offerings that they would bring to the Lord was to feed people. Just like in the law days, when people brought an offering to the priests, uh, there's a, a misnomer out there that they just would set that whole animal up there and that God would send fire down and consume it. But that's sometimes that would happen. There was... Very few and far between. That would be a special offering up on a hill or something. But most every offering that was brought was to feed people. When it says offering to the Lord, that was you were feeding people with that. So Cain, knowing this is what pleases God, brings, keeps the best for himself, you see. And gives just what he doesn't want anyway. Abel brings the firstlings. You know, it wasn't just one offering. This was a big, huge deal, just like it was in the days of the law. They had the morning sacrifice, the evening sacrifice, and sacrifices all throughout the day to feed all the priests, all the children of Israel that were poor, And so in this, it's no different here. This is exactly what was going on. This is why God required offerings. It wasn't just so that he could burn them up. They were to feed people. And so even right here at the very beginning of the scripture, God has not respect to Cain because of how he's treating others right here. This is what's going on. And we see in the law, look at this one here. In Leviticus 25, this is where this is talked about. Talking about our brother. And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bondservant but as an hired servant and as a sojourner. He shall be with thee and shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. And then shall he depart from thee, both he and his children with him, and shall return unto his own family and unto the possession of his father shall he return. For they are my servants which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt They shall not be sold as bondmen. Look at this, verse 43 is where I want to go with this. Thou shalt not rule over him with rigor, but shalt fear thy God. Remember what Cain said? 
or what God said would, would be Cain's spirit if he continued with that spirit that he had there that day. He says there in verse 7, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. What sins he talking about? The, the spirit will be in him and overcharged for him to rule over his brother. To rule over him. And we see the very next thing that happens. I didn't put that up here. Um, but after in Genesis chapter 4, the very next thing that happens is Cain couldn't get his brother to uh, get under him where he belonged in Cain's idea of it all. He couldn't get his brother to serve him. And so he kills him. If he can't rule over him, listen, this is why people do this all the time. If they can't have things their way, they either end their own life or they end their wife's life or whoever it is that they can't rule over. This is what's going on here. God does not want us to rule over our brothers or sisters in Christ. It says with rigor there. Thou shalt not rule over him with rigor. There's times when we have to rule over people, like when you're a boss or something at work. But with rigor means rigid, you know, very harshly. And so, but see the contrast? Don't rule over your brother, but fear thy God. That's having to do with others. How you esteem others, how you treat others is walking in the fear of God. The Bible is laying this out for us. And then we go to the Proverbs and there is almost a verse in every chapter of Proverbs teaching us what the fear of the Lord is. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of of knowledge but fools despise wisdom and instruction see that was Cain he despised the instruction of God God told him exactly what was going to happen if he didn't do something with his spirit his spirit was overcharged that day his spirit was I'll give the people in need what is not any good anyway I'll give them what I don't need I'll keep the good to myself. Abel brought what was great. And if Abel would have got to keep on living, the Bible gives us a, a promise that he would have had more than he ever had. And that was the instruction that, that God gave to Cain. He could have had the same thing if he just had a different spirit. If he would just change his spirit and stop heaping to himself everything that is good and start giving some of that good to those that are in need and then even more good would come upon him. But since his spirit was to please himself, then he became a vagabond in the earth just like the Jews. That's a picture. It's a type of the Jews. The Jews killed their brother, Jesus, for envy because God had respect unto him and not. To them. This is Proverbs 2. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. The word understanding, 
the first definition of understanding. You could explain it in one word. It's humility. Has nothing to do with comprehension. That's what we use it for. I mean, I shouldn't say it has nothing to do with it. It does. It's just when you use the word understanding for just meaning comprehension, you lose the whole meaning of understanding. Better get my Bible to do this. You've seen me do this before, I'm sure. But this is understanding. This is what it is. You stand under others. You're not first. Others are first. When you realize that, when you recognize that, then, what's it say? If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. You want to say something? Why would you say her? Her is wisdom. I should have said that at the beginning. This is wisdom speaking. If you search for wisdom, if you ask for wisdom and understanding, that's she is talked about as a her. It is. It's, it's because everything else is in the masculine and a, a man, when he is from a very little person, begins to look for a wife. So it's using wisdom as, and even Cain, as he is doing what he's doing, God tells him, if your spirit don't change, you're going to be married to sin. Sin lieth at the door. And everything that's said after that is the same thing that God said to Eve when she failed, when she ate of the fruit, and she said, now your husband, your desire is going to be to your husband, and he shall rule over thee. If your spirit is bad, sin lies at the door. And if, if you don't change your spirit, you will be married to that sin. It will follow you all the days of your life. How many of you know that once you partake of something, it's hard to ever do without it again? This is to gain the knowledge and understanding. It it's goes all the way back to the way Cain treated Abel, his brother, for one, but there's a whole other things going on there that we see in later scripture shows us what was taking place. There's other writings that even talk about it. And they're not biblical because the, the Bible is just a narrative. It gives us the basics and uh, doesn't tell us every detail of life, but there's the book of Jasher tells that story in detail and it talks about how the two brothers, that Cain was um, jealous of his brother for a long time because people clung to him because he was nice. He just had a good disposition. And Cain was not so much. Cain wanted to be the boss in every situation. And so the fear of the Lord, the, to fear God, goes all the way back to there and it means it has to do with how you treat others what's your spirit like when it when it is as it pertains to others be not wise in thine own eyes fear the lord and depart from evil it shall be health to thy navel and morrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. See, this is what Cain didn't do and what Abel did do. He honored the Lord with his first fruits. 
so shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. That's a spiritual phrase there, new wine. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. See, this is going to define evil. It's got a colon there after the word evil. That means it's going to define what you're supposed to hate. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way. And the froward mouth do I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. This is wisdom again talking here. This is not God talking. I mean, it's what God possesses. God possesses wisdom. But this is wisdom speaking. It says, counsel is mind and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me, kings reign and princes decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. I love them that love me. See, that can't be God, because God loved the world even when they didn't love Him. This is talking about wisdom. It means wisdom will work for you like a good uh, broker. Someone that knows how to invest your money. This is what wisdom does for you. Wisdom loves those that loves it. If you love wisdom, you're going to be using it, you see. If you're not wise in your own eyes, like what we've seen earlier. If we are ready and willing to take wisdom from other people, gain wisdom from people that have experience and, and that sort of thing, we will, verse 18, riches and honor are with me, yea, durable riches and righteousness. And this is not talking about money. It can be. Definitely having good wisdom, we can invest our money good. And But this is on another plane. This is talking about a spiritual thing. These We'll have spiritual riches. When we get to heaven, we'll see all the people that we influenced for the good. Riches and honor are with me, yea, durable riches. They stand. They, they're not corrupted by rust and, and moths like Jesus talked about in the book of Matthew. They're durable riches and righteousness. Wisdom says, my fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. I was just talking to somebody the other day. They... Uh, they're a contractor, and when they get to a place on a job where they start losing money, they just leave the job. They just leave it. And they're starting to get that name. And I told him that a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. If you'll stay with a job, you finish it, even though you're losing money. You work harder. Make money some other place, but don't leave that job. That's what this is talking about. That's wisdom talking there because that will help you later. People will come later and say, hey, you did a good job over here. Will you do my job? Another person, will you do mine? But if you start getting a name of, well, I was losing money, so I just walked off the job, then the, the guy that, had me do the job, he's got to find somebody else to do it and it's going to cost him all this money and he's going to tell everybody he knows not to use that guy. That's right. That's wisdom talking. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. You know what this is saying? If you walk in the fear of the Lord, in everything that you do, people are not going to be wanting to hurt you. People are not going to be wanting to steal from you. People are not going to be wanting to get back at you. 
That's what it's saying. It's not saying nothing bad will ever take place in you. We live in a fallen world. Things bad happen all the time to good people. We just talked about that last week. This is saying if you treat people good, people are not going to come and visit you with evil. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life. Everything in life, and that's the abundant life that Christ was talking about. Doesn't mean everything's always going to be peaches and cream. We may not have money, just like the guy that that would have been out some money if he'd have stayed and finished the job. But man, later, what's it going to do for him? See, that's a picture of us in this life. Surrendering ourselves to others is not going to build our wealth. But it's going to build our heavenly wealth. We're sending it forward. That's why Jesus said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, but lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust does not corrupt. That's the fear of the Lord. You're really fearing Him for other people. Jesus said, if you judge unrighteously, I'll judge you the same way you're judging those people. If you have a knowledge of that and you, your life is defined by that, that's walk, walking in the fear of the Lord. We're out of time. I hope this was a blessing. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this. We need to know what it means to fear the Lord. The world needs to fear Him for sure in the deepest sense of the word fear. But that's not what's going to bring them to Him. That's why He he sent us with a commission. He sent us with a gave us His Spirit that is gracious, that is kind, that is loving to show the world who you are. And they don't have to fear you if they'll just receive you. Then the fear of the Lord takes on a whole new meaning. It's not the same. Then the fear of the Lord becomes a fear for the souls of men. And it excites us to do ministry. Help us to swallow that hard saying and give of ourselves and not always just want to give to people what we don't need or what we don't want. Let's give some of the firstlings of our flock and just watch you bless. Show us how to do that. Help us walk in your feet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.